Let's see how the Pauli matrices can act as single qubit gates. In this video, I'm going to be using Dirac notation, and I will also be using the matrix representations of operators. All of the matrix representations will be done in the Pauli Z eigen basis. Let's have a look at a general state that describes a qubit. A qubit is the quantum analog of the classical bit. So let's have a look at how we can represent the general state of a qubit. We have these two basis states. These are the eigenstates of the Pauli Z operator. They have eigenvalues plus one and minus one. And these two states are, they actually form the computational basis. So this is very important in quantum computing and in quantum information. And what we're going to do is we're going to take a linear combination with these coefficients, alpha and beta. And this linear combination represents a general state. And that general state is denoted by psi. And you can see Dirac notation over here. These are all kets. This is a ket, a ket, and a ket. And we can also represent this as a column vector. So this is the matrix representation. It's a column vector. And the entries of this column vector are those coefficients. They're the coefficients of these computational basis states. And we can also find the bra versions. So the bra versions over here, they are the Hermitian adjoints. So over here we have the bra version of this general state psi, and then we have a linear combination of the bras. Notice that there are little stars over here in these coefficients, because these are complex conjugates of these coefficients. So alpha and beta, they're not restricted to just the real numbers, they can be complex numbers. So that's why we have to take the complex conjugate when we take the Hermitian adjoint. And the Hermitian adjoint of this uh, matrix over here, this column vector, it turns into a row vector. So we have a row vector and all of the entries have been complex conjugated. So the Hermitian adjoint involves doing two things. You have to take the transpose and you also have to take the complex conjugate of all the entries. That's how you take the Hermitian adjoint of a matrix. So now that we have this ket and this bra version of a general state that describes a qubit, what we can do is we can take the inner product of these two. So we can take the inner product of the state with itself. And what is that going to give us? Well, we can write this in several different forms. We can write it out in this matrix product over here. We have a row vector and a column vector. And then we can do matrix multiplication, and that's going to give us this sum over here. And we can also identify these two terms as actually the absolute value of this complex number alpha squared and the absolute value of this complex number beta squared. And we want to impose this condition over here. We want this to be equal to 1. And if the inner product of the state with itself is equal to 1, that is called the normalization condition. So we say that the state is normalized. And that is really essential because if we don't normalize the state, then we're going to have to keep dividing by factors. And this makes computations uh, a lot more easy. So this is normalization. And this is the general way to represent a qubit state in the computational basis. This 0 and this 1, these guys are just labels. We can put any label on these two states. But what is important to note is that this is an orthonormal basis. So both this zero state over here and this one state, both of them are normalized and they are mutually orthogonal. So if you take the inner product of any one of these states with itself, you're going to get one. But if you do the inner product of one with the other, so a different state, you're going to get zero. That is orthogonality. And when we have orthogonality and all the states are normalized, then we have an orthonormal basis. And because we're dealing with a Hilbert space that is two-dimensional, we only need two basis states. So that is a single qubit system. The only accessible states uh, of this system are a ground state and an excited state. We can think of that uh, in terms of a, a physical system that we're trying to describe using this mathematics. So we have the general state. We have it in its ket form and in its bra form. Now let's use the Pauli matrices to act on this general state. And let's see what effect it actually has. So let's get started with the Pauli X operator. 
And the Pali X operator is analogous to the classical NOT gate. So sometimes it's actually called a bit flip because it flips the basis states. It flips the zero and the one. Let's see, what does that actually mean? How, how can we represent that in a matrix? So this, this matrix over here is the Pali X matrix, and we're applying it to a general state. So this column vector is the same as this ket. And when we apply it, the effect of this matrix multiplication is going to be to swap the coefficients. So the alpha and the beta are going to swap places. Alpha was the coefficient of this ground state, and beta was the coefficient of the excited state. But now the coefficients have swapped roles. So this is called a bit flip. And it's a very common uh, procedure that occurs in modeling quantum mechanical systems. And in fact, errors are usually modeled as bit flips, because this is a very common type of error that can occur. A zero can change to a one, or one can change to a zero. So classically, this is analogous to the classical NOT gate from Boolean algebra. Now, we've seen the matrix representation of this, but let's have a look at the Dirac notation representation. So in Dirac notation, this, all of this stuff here is equivalent to this matrix. We're just writing it in a different way. This combination over here is equivalent to this matrix. We're taking ket bra combinations. So when we were taking the inner product, that is a bra ket. But when we take the outer product, that is a ket bra. So we swap the order. And this gives us complex numbers. The inner product, when evaluated, gives complex numbers. But this gives operators. So we can use these outer products of the computational basis states to make operators. And this 0, 1 and this 1, 0, they actually correspond to the off diagonal entries. And you can see we don't have any terms that correspond to 0, 0 or 1, 1. So there are no diagonal entries. There's only off diagonal entries. And both of them are equal to 1 because the coefficients of these two outer products are implicitly 1. So we just have 1s over here. And when you do the matrix multiplication, it is equivalent to applying these guys to the general state. And here we have the general state psi written in the same form that we have up here. So if you take this outer product and you act on this state, you're going to have a 1 and a 0. And that 1 and a 0, when you take the inner product, that's going to give 0. But if you take this one and you act on this state over here, you're going to have 1 and 1. And that inner product is going to yield 1. So then we're just going to be left with this ket, this 0 ket over here. And beta is going to be the coefficient of the 0 ket. So that's what we have in this term. And how did we get this alpha? Well, that comes from this outer product. If you act with this outer product on this term over here, the 0 and the 0, their inner product yields 1. And so we're just left with this ket. So this ket 1 has the coefficient alpha. What if we were to act with this operator on this state over here? Well, here we have a 0 and a 1. And a 0 and a 1, their inner product is going to be 0. So we're not going to have any contribution there. So these are the only terms that are left when we expand all of these combinations out. So you can see that Dirac notation and the matrix representation are equivalent. So whichever one you feel more comfortable with, you can use. So that is the Pauli X operator acting on a general qubit state. It has the effect of a bit flip. Now let's have a look at the phase shift operator. So this over here, this operator, P as a function of phi, that is called the phase shift operator. How does this act on a general qubit state? Well, its matrix representation has this form. It is a diagonal matrix. The entries are 1 and e to the i phi. So if you act with this diagonal matrix onto this general state, what you're going to get is that this alpha coefficient is going to remain unchanged, but the beta coefficient is going to have an extra phase factor. So that's this e to the i phi. And this phase factor is a relative phase between the two computational basis states. A global phase, if we were to multiply a global phase on both of these states, that would have no physical significance because we can only measure differences between the phases. But if you have a relative phase between this state and this state, that is measurable. That has a measurable difference. So when you uh, have that state and then you interact with other states, that is actually going to have a measurable effect. So for global phases, we don't really care about them because there's no physical significance. But these relative phases between states 
they are physically significant. So that is the role of this phase shift operator. And if you use the phase shift operator with other operators, you can do some very interesting things. And that's actually a lot of the beauty of uh, quantum mechanics and, and using quantum computation comes from being able to do this relative phase shift. This Pali X operator, you can do bit flips with Boolean algebra, with classical computers. But this phase shift business, that is not something that you can do with Boolean algebra. So this is the general phase shift operator. A special case of the phase shift operator is actually the Pali Z operator. So the Pali Z operator, it has a minus one over here. And where does this minus one come from? Well, it's a special case of e to the i phi. If we set phi equal to pi, then we're going to get z. And we can also actually set it to minus pi as well. Because if you remember the unit circle, pi is on the opposite side. So if we go plus pi or minus pi, we're going to get the same thing. And that actually uh, brings us to a more general property of this phase shift operator. If you take the Hermitian adjoint of the phase shift operator, is the same as negating this angle phi. So if you put a minus sign on that phi, it's exactly the same as doing the Hermitian adjoint. You can do the transpose. The transpose has no effect because it's a diagonal matrix, but the complex uh, conjugate does have an effect. It changes the sign up over here on this i. And that is equivalent to negating the angle. And you can see that if we were to substitute pi over here, this would actually be equal. Both sides would be equal. So putting pi over here and putting minus pi over here, both of those would give minus 1. So the Pauli Z operator is Hermitian. We have a Hermitian operator. The Pauli X operator is also Hermitian. All three Pauli operators, X, Y, and Z, they are Hermitian operators. So this uh, Pauli Z operator is just a special type of phase shift. And we can actually call it a phase flip because it flips the sign over here. So this is a minus one that gets introduced on this beta coefficient. So that's a phase flip. So here we have a bit flip and here we have a phase flip. And in quantum information, you can model errors as phase flips and bit flips. So those are two common types of errors. So here we have the Pauli Z operator, and that is just a special case of this phase shift operator. Let's have a look at some other interesting types of phase shift operators. If instead of pi, we chose pi on 2, we would get an i over here. So just substituting uh, pi on 2 over here, that yields this i. And this has a name. This is called s. This is the s operator. And you can also write this s as the square root of z, the square root of the Pauli z operator. If you apply this operator twice, it is equivalent to squaring it, and that is equivalent to applying the Pauli z operator. But have a look at this. This is not Hermitian. If you take the Hermitian adjoint, this turns into a minus i. So that property of being Hermitian, that is just a special case. In general, phase shift operators are not Hermitian. The Pauli z operator is a special case, and it is Hermitian. Another phase shift operator uh, occurs when we, when we set phi equal to pi on 4. And this is given the name t. So we use capital T to denote this operator. And you can also write that as the square root of s, or as the double square root, or the fourth root of z. So if you were to apply this t twice, you would get the same effect as applying s. And if you were to apply this t four times, that would also be the same effect as applying this z operator over here. So we've seen phase shifts, we've seen phase flips, and we've seen bit flips. Now let's have a look at the Pauli y operator. The Pauli y operator is actually a combination of bit flips and phase flips. So it's a combination of, of both. And we can see why by expanding out in this matrix representation. So this is the matrix representation of the Pauli operator. And if we act on a general state, what we get is this combination over here. So we have minus i appearing this on this beta, and we have i appearing as a coefficient of this alpha. So we have swapped the coefficients around. And we've also introduced a relative phase of, of minus, there's a minus sign between these two states. But there's this pesky factor of i. So what can we do with this i? Well, let's have a look. We can factor out that i, and that gives us this state over here. But this state looks exactly like what would happen if we applied a phase flip followed by a bit flip. And that is written in, in this form in matrix representations. 
So here we have the Pauli Z, and here we have the Pauli X. And we write them from left to right, but when we apply them, we, we first apply the one that's furthest on the right, and then the one that's furthest on the left. So the one that's closest to the state gets applied first. So first we apply this uh, phase flip, which introduces a minus sign onto beta, and then we apply this bit flip, which flips the two. And when we flip these two guys, we get this. So this minus sign was introduced first, and then we followed that by flipping these two coefficients around. But have a look at this. We can do it another way. We can factor out minus i, and then that puts the minus sign on this alpha. So then what we can do is we can still keep this phase factor of minus i out here, but then we can swap the order of these two operators. We first do a bit flip, and then we do a phase flip. So first we swap them around, and then we put a minus sign on the bottom one. So you can see that both of these are equivalent, but the only difference is a minus sign that we can factor out the front. So then from, from this, we can conclude that the Pauli Y operator is exactly the same as I times X times Z, and it's also the same as minus I times Z times X. So if we swap the order, we have to introduce a minus sign. This factor of I and minus I is just a global phase factor. And global phase factors don't actually have a physical significance. It's only relative phases between states that have a physical significance. So the Pauli Y operator is exactly the same as applying a bit flip and a phase flip. And this identity is very essential. We're going to be using this identity in later videos in the quantum mechanics playlist. So as a summary of this video, we talked about the general state of a qubit. We expressed that in Dirac notation. We wrote it as a ket and as a bra. We looked at the matrix representations. We saw normalization, this normalization coefficient, or this normalization condition, which gives us uh, a lot of uh, easy calculations later, so we don't have to keep dividing by normalization factors. And we also saw what the effects were of the Pauli X, the Pauli Y, and the Pauli Z operators on general qubit states. And we also got a little uh, glimpse into other types of single qubit operators, which are not necessarily Hermitian. So these guys over here, the S and the T operator, they are not Hermitian operators. But the Pauli Z, the Pauli X, and the Pauli Y, they are all Hermitian. And can you imagine what would happen if you took the identity operator and you acted on this state over here? It would remain unchanged. So the identity operator has the columns swapped over over here. We just have a diagonal matrix with ones and off diagonals, uh, off, the, off diagonal elements are all zero. So when you act on the identity over here, you would just get alpha, beta. And the Pauli X is just a swapped over version where we flip these guys around. We're going to be using these concepts in later videos in the quantum mechanics playlist. And you can find those videos if you click over here.